Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Minwi Metri. So I thought long and hard about what to talk about tonight, and I decided in our last meeting, uh, in which I had the opportunity to speak, that I wanted to talk a little bit about the intricacies of Taoism in Zen. Um, and I want this to be a little bit more than a stream of consciousness type of, of discussion. So I, I hope it will be. Um, but something occurred this last week, and I don't know, I know Venerable Unsan was there. I don't know if Robert or, or Naga had the opportunity to be there. Um, but we had a memorial service for Venerable Wanji. And, um, and it was, we did it online. And um, there were a number of actors in there. Uh, one, Richard, she Richard Sears, who is the leader of Five Mountains Inn, his Dharma name is Joshu, or um, that is, um, that he's the, he's the, um, the, the name Joshu is the Japanese translation of, of uh, the character in the first koan of Woman's Book of Koans. Um, and uh, he's the one about, does a dog have Buddha nature? So he was the master when the monk asked that question. Um, and so that got me thinking, wow, that, that's a powerful koan. And not, let me stop and say, I'm not teaching a koan tonight. That's not, not my point. My point is to teach a little bit about Taoism and how Taoism appears in that, uh, in that koan. And unless you read it in context, you totally miss that. And so my goal tonight is to talk a little bit about how we read that in context of the ancient masters. Um, but to begin that conversation, um, there was also something that occurred. Uh, there was some chanting that was done, in, including Jijang Bosal chanting, etc. There was some chanting to uh, Amitabha Buddha, um, various bodhisattvas. And it got me to thinking about um, when I used to practice in a Pure Land temple. So I used to practice Buddhism, kind of more or less my first real practice into Buddhism uh, was in a Vietnamese Pure Land temple. And the abbot of this temple was a Zen master. Um, and yet he did not teach Zen or Vietnamese Zen team, as they would call it. He did not teach Vietnamese Zen to the devotees that would come there and worship. Um, and I asked the master, but everybody called him master. Um, they, did, uh, they didn't really even call him Thai, which is the name that means teacher, right? The younger male monks were called Thai, but he was always called master. And um, so I inquired one day as to why he was called master. And so one of the junior monks explained to me that he was a Zen master, um, but that he had established this temple as a Pure Land temple. And I thought that was fascinating. So I asked the old man one day, whose name was Tik Wang Dao. Uh, you might see that Dao at the end of his name. Um, I asked the old master one day, why did he teach his devotees there? Why did he teach them pure land Buddhism and not, not Zen, not, you know, what he was a master in? And he said, Zen is too hard. Pure land is something they can practice right now. And so we talked about it just a little bit. I didn't get into great detail because my Vietnamese was not existent and his English was a bit broken. Um, but we talked about it a little bit. And there's a difference between Pure Land and Zen. And the difference is in the immediacy of what we study and what we practice. And in Pure Land, devotees are generally taught, practice recitations, practice recitations to Amitabha Buddha, to practice to recitations to 
um, Kashiti Garba, to practice recitations to Avalokiteshvara, etc. And those recitations will help you be reborn in a pure land, and there you can gain your enlightenment or your awakening. But in Zen, we teach, if you want to be awakened, do not waste your time by night or day. Do it right now. And that's the essence of Zen. What we practice in Zen is practicing to awaken now, not to postpone it to some future life. So the essence of what we practice being let's do it right now pre-existed all forms of Pure Land Buddhism in China. And then it spread from there into Japan and Vietnam and all the realms of, of Chinese influence of Buddhism. But Chan pre-existed that, um, and it pre-existed it by actually a great number of years. Um, but the roots of Chan, or Zen as we call it today, are actually in Taoism. And I want to read to you, if you'll bear with me here just a moment, I want to read to you the very first chapter of Tao Te Ching. Um, as you know, the Tao Te Ching is a, a seminal book um, purportedly written by Lao Tzu, um, which just means old master. So it's probably not likely that one person existed named Lao Tzu, but these are collections of, of wisdom that, you know, are 2,000, 3,000 years old that were collected into uh, kind of a repository of what the basic teachings of of Taoism were. And you can find most of the basic teachings both in the I Ching, in the Tao Te Ching, uh, and in um, Chuang Tzu. So in those three texts, you find the basics of what Taoism really teaches. But in the first chapter here, I'm going to read this to you because this is where you're going to see how much Zen or Chan um, ties into Taoism in the very first chapter. So the very first chapter of Tao Te Ching says this, a way called way isn't the perennial way. A name that names isn't the perennial name. The named is mother to 10,000 things, but the unnamed is origin to all heaven and earth. In perennial absence, you see mystery. And in perennial presence, you see appearance. Though the two are one and the same, once they arise, they differ in name. One and the same, they're called dark enigma, dark enigma, deep within dark, dark enigma, gateway of all mystery. So what's interesting there, we are presented in the early teachings of Taoism, there is something called absence and something called presence. And presence is all things that are around us. That is kind of in modern Zen language, that is the relative, right? That's the world we live in, the mundane world as, as the Buddha would call it. But the super mundane, that origin, that form of emptiness that all things in nature spring forth from, that's absence. And so absence in a lot of modern Buddhism and as Buddhism came into China and, you know, co-mingled with Taoism, this word emptiness was very similar to the word absence and they became more or less interchangeable. So the early practitioners, including Bodhidharma, who was, you know, we know somewhere circa 500 or so in the, uh, before the, uh, no, 500 uh, in the common era. So what are we looking at? Uh, 1900 years ago, 1800 years ago or so. Bodhidharma, people think he came and, and, and brought his sense of ideas. And again, Bodhidharma is another one of these characters. We're not sure if he existed just as a soul person, or if it was a collection of wisdoms and sayings from, from ancient Chan masters. But a lot is attributed to Bodhidharma, and so we'll take him as an individual. And so he came into ex he came into into forefront or knowledge uh, in China with a lot of ideas that were very similar 
to Taoist ideas. And it made it acceptable to the population in a lot of ways that he was teaching these ideas that were very ontological, much like the Buddha taught. By ontological, I mean essences of the whole cosmos, of existence and non-existence. And so the Taoists were able to quickly grab a hold of what this interesting guy named Shakyamuni Buddha was taught, had taught, because he seemed to understand that difference between the relative and the absolute. He seemed to have discovered, to them, he seemed to have discovered what this true nature of the mind really was. And so this idea um, that what he discovered under the Bodhi tree was very similar to what the Taoists had been talking about in their ontological perspective of everything being one in the cosmos made a lot of sense to them. And so they were able to start to use Buddhism as a vehicle to teach the same principles that were already well accepted in China. So this idea of absence and presence really was a strong foundational basis, philosophical foundational basis to many of the early Chan masters. And uh, it was really important that this idea of absence and presence um, be made to be understood within the Buddhist realm. And as I said, Buddhism became a vehicle in a lot of ways for these Taoists to teach what they were trying to explain uh, in their ideas of the cosmos. And so I note here, if you're looking at your Zoom screen right now and you have the, the name of our Sangha here, One Mind Zen, and you see the symbol in the middle is the Chinese symbol that is translated either heart or mind, because in, in Chinese, the heart and the mind had a, a, a symbiotic or one type of relationship. That mind here that is written there in the one mind, Zen, that character, like I said, can mean heart or mind. It's the same character they use in the Heart Sutra in Chinese. And so some translators have even argued that the Heart Sutra would be better translated as the Mind Sutra. And when you go back to the Taoist teachings of understanding the mind and the pre-thinking mind, as we teach in Zen, then you start to understand that Heart Sutra in a little bit different sense. And you begin to understand how that emptiness and absence of Taoism are one and the same thing that are being chanted about. And in, and in fact, in most of the translations, absence and presence, those words appear in the Heart Sutra, um, but we've translated, in the, we've translated them into English into no eyes, no ears, no tongue, no mouth, you know, all those no concepts rather than absence, absence mind, absence, meaning pre-thinking mind. So that's what the, the Taoists were trying to teach. They were trying to teach one of the things, in, uh, let me, let me backtrack just a little bit. So one of the things they were trying to teach that we teach in Buddhism very strongly is that concept of no self. Because when we gain that concept of self, that's what separates us from the rest of the cosmos. When we identify ourselves, this is me, I feel this, I experience this, then I am separate from the rest of the cosmos because I am an individual that exists. So what they were trying to teach in Taoism, and which we very much uh, try to grasp a hold of, in Buddhism, or at least in Zen Buddhism especially, is that concept of no self. And that's the same concept that the ancient Taoists taught. So also in the Tao Te Ching that I was reading from earlier, um, it says, how will you find your true self unless you lose yourself? And so you cannot find who that true self is, meaning true self being part of the cosmos, until you lose that identity of a self. So these concepts were the same. 
and they were they were spoken in a very philosophical context. So I want to give you now going back to Zhao Zhou or Zhou Shu as uh, as Richard Sears as Richard Sears Dharma name is. So Zhao Zhou is the Chinese name for Zhou Shu, and um, so in the traditional translation into English of of that first koan, um, I'm going to read it from Guo Gu's book, uh, The No Gate Gateway, or Passing Through the Gateless Barrier, um, because he gives the traditional Zen translation of this, um, this first koan. So um, if you bear with me just a second, I lost my place. So the very first koan, I call, as I said before, it's called Jiao Zhou's Dog. And the very traditional American translation goes like this. A monk asked Jiao Zhou, does a dog have Buddha nature or not? And we all know the answer to that, whether you learned it from a, Kore I mean, from a um, Korean lineage, whether you learned it from a Chinese lineage, or whether you learned it from a Japanese lineage. We know the, ja the Japanese word is, the response from Zhou Shu was mu, right? And we all know that their response from Jiao Zhou was Wu, uh, which is the Chinese version of the word Mu. Um, but I ask you, and this is not really rhetorical. I, if you know an answer or if you think you know an answer, I, I invite your comment. But I ask you, why don't we translate? We translate nearly everything else into English into that question. Does a dog have Buddha nature? But the answer, we don't translate. We leave it in Chinese. Why do we do that? So it's not a trick and I'm not trying to catch you, but I always wondered this myself. The first time I read this, I'm like, why is everything else in English and that word they keep in Chinese or they keep in Japanese if you learned it uh, from a Japanese school or Japanese master and they would have said mu. Um, and the concept is, you know, you got to think about this and most translations from most Zen teachers or Zen masters is, the Zen master here, Zhao Zhou or Zhou Shu, is trying to wake up his student by throwing something out there because everybody knows that there's Buddha nature in everything. So how dare he say no, because that's how they translate Mu or Wu to be. Wow. Um, I would say for a thousand years of Zen, that's how this has been translated. No. And yet... To say it means no is to ignore the philosophical nature of what the ancient Zen masters taught. And they taught Taoism through a Buddhist vehicle. And so what Zhao Zhou actually said was Wu. But what does Wu mean? Wu means absence. And so, while it could mean yes, I mean, it could mean no by itself, it could also, in a philosophical sense, mean absence. So, when the student or the, the monk asked Zhao Zhou, does a dog have, the word have in Chinese is also the word they use in Taoism for presence. So you could say, in presence, does a dog have Buddha nature? And Zhao Zhou's answer is absence. Now there's something to think about. Now it's not an issue of, okay, he's given me a non-truism to make me think, wait a minute, why is the Zen master telling me that something doesn't have Buddha nature when everything has Buddha nature? We all know that. He's not challenging whether or not there is Buddha nature in a dog. He's telling his student, wake up. Because in all things presence, there is absence. And in all things absence, there is presence. So what's he saying? That's something I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to give you the answer to the koan. But if you hear or read this koan 
in straight up English context without the philosophical basis for it, you think he's saying no. But he's not really saying no. He's throwing this back to a Taoist teaching of absence and presence. And that's what you have to understand. They say in presence, as I read from the Tao Te Ching, presence is the 10,000 things that spring forth out of nothingness. Out of what? Out of absence. So all these things in the relative world that we see come forth out of the absolute. So one might think in meditation, what does this mean, Minhui? What does it mean does a dog have in presence, Buddha nature, absence? Everything, including the Buddha, has Buddha nature, but it all comes from absence. So there's much more to the story there. And so for those of us who are practitioners of Zen, I encourage you, read the Taoist seminal works. Study them. Find a translator you like and see what it is the Taoists were teaching. Because when you do, you begin to understand what the Chan masters were saying. It used to disturb me. When I came, I, like I said, I came from a first a Pure Land background where all kinds of reverence is paid to Amitabha Buddha and to Guan and to Kuan Yin, and to Da Shi Chi, or we call Bo, um, Shiti Garba, or um, Ji Jung Bo Sal in our tradition. Uh, lots of homage is paid to them, great reverence. And I came to Zen, and I would hear these Zen masters, or read about these Zen masters, they would say, what is, they would say, the, the student would say, what is Buddha? And you get the answer like a dried up shit stick. And you're thinking to myself, I've been paying reverence to Buddha for how many years? And you're telling me he's a dried up shit stick or he's three pounds of flax or. It's because there's something missing in the translation there. And you have to understand this ontological basis of oneness in the universe that Taoism taught and that was brought into Chan and therefore Zen. To get to understand that when the Zen master says Buddha is a dried shit stick, he's not saying, hey, Sid, Siddhartha, you're a dried up shit stick. That's not what he's saying. And to interpret it such is to misinterpret what Zen is trying to teach. And that is Buddha nature is always found in the absence. And in the present, that presence, we may or may not see it. But in the absence, it's always there. In that great ontological understanding of the cosmos, we are all one. And therefore, we all have Buddha nature. Thank you.